Gengar gang, what is going on? My name is Ryan, this is the Analytic Gengar, and welcome to another video. In today's episode of TCG Toolkit, we discuss why population reports might be deceiving you, and what you need to know about understanding population and understanding all of the different factors that can drive a Pokemon card's value, rarity, and overall demand in the current market environment. Now, today's video is inspired by a recent-ish trend that I noticed. Long story short, um, obviously lots of different YouTubers nowadays do PSA graded returns. They get the cards back and then they'll do something like, uh, there's only five of these in the world. Now, that's cool because factually it's correct. There might only be five of those cards in the world and that's totally cool, totally fine. However, in a constantly evolving marketplace like the one we have seen for Pokemon over the past couple of months, it has become increasingly important to understand all of the different factors behind that statement. There are five of these in the world. It implies that there might actually be some value to that card. However, that's not always the case. There are many cards with very low populations, mainly because people don't care to submit them. And in today's video, we're going to look at three of the big reasons why different Pokemon cards have become so sought after once they have been graded at a certain condition. Now, as a brief overview of today's video, we're going to be going over rarity by three different elements. By demand, by design, which is broken up into a subsection for print and production, and rarity by play. And so in today's video, I'll be using some relatively vintage Pokemon cards in order to show examples of each and every single one of those types of rarity and help you better understand why those cards and their related population reports actually imply value. Now, a couple of things before we get started. I will use PSA as my proxy, mainly because their data is relatively easy to understand and also because I think it will appeal to the broadest audience. However, the same can be said for both CGC and BGS as well as any other grading company that cares enough to maintain a database with their population reports. In theory, the same exact stuff that we're seeing on PSA should, in theory, extrapolate itself out to other grading companies. So although the numbers for some of the cards I'll show you today might be different, because obviously Beckett has something like pristine gold label and pristine black label, there should be a similar number of clusters or a similar proportioning across the different grades. So just bear that in mind. The other thing is that we need to very clearly define rarity. Now bear in mind that although this is a TCG Toolkit video and I will be using real life factual examples, there is a little bit of subjecticism in this video sort of baked in because the way that I define things might not be the way that you define things. And so I'll be very clear about the way that I'm defining everything we're stepping through today so that you can get as clear a picture of what I'm actually speaking about in today's video. Bear in mind that if you do disagree and want to engage in some discourse, I always recommend that down below in the comments. I'm happy to chat and I do try to keep up with the comments on a video as best I can. And if you learn something new today, I definitely challenge you to leave a like on the video and let me know that down below in the comments as well. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and define rarity. For the sake of today's video, and in reference to population reports, we're going to go ahead and define rarity as being a Pokemon card is rare when it has a low population report and is legitimately demanded within a collectibles market. Meaning, if the card was listed for sale, the card would be very highly demanded, it would sell at auction, it would receive multiple offers. It is not going to be a card that has a low population report but is not demanded and it will not be defined as rare just because it has a number lesser than the total population of a similar trading card. Meaning your reverse foil Nidorina from EX Dragon Frontiers will not count as a rare card today because although the population report might be minuscule compared to other cards and you could legitimately make the claim that there are only 10 of these in the world, 
they don't necessarily count as being rare because one has to beg the question, how many people actually legitimately want to purchase that card once it has been graded and is a population of 10? While it's a neat statistic and fact, it doesn't necessarily indicate that the card is rare. And so in today's video, a rare card for sake of our discussion will be a card that has a low population and is legitimately and viciously being sought after in the Pokemon collectibles market. Now the other thing to bear in mind for today's video is the law of supply and demand. If supply is high, theoretically prices are lower. If demand is high, theoretically prices are higher. So everything works in inverse. And the idea of scarcity also plays a significant role here. Bear in mind that scarcity is one of the key elements for my definition of rarity, where the less trading cards there are, theoretically, the more rare it is. But obviously, there are many different reasons why that may buck the tradition and the theory. So with that said and established and out of the way, let's get into our first example. Our first type of rarity will be rarity by demand. And where better to look than the original Holy Grail Pokemon 1999 base set English first edition Charizard holographic card. So let's take a look at the population report right here on screen. As you can see, it's being highlighted right there. And let's go ahead and get that centered and let's take a look at it. So. All the way down at the autograph level, we have 19 cards. There are 33 ones, five 1.5s, 1 45, 145, 28, so on and such forth. You can read it across the screen. There are 649 PSA 9s and 120 PSA 10s. Now, in total, there's 2,586 first edition Charizards that have ever been graded in the Pokemon card market. Now let's just for a minute go ahead and take a look at quite literally any other card in first edition. So let's take a look at Chansey Holographic first edition for example. Now we know that the most recent Chansey sold for about $20,000. But here's an interesting thing. Number by number Chansey has only 46 copies in PSA 10 condition. Charizard has 120. And so there's almost a three to one gap in population. For every three Charizards, there's about only one Chansey in PSA 10. So purely based on number, right? That same kind of theory that everyone likes to put in their thumbnails and in their titles. Theoretically, Chanseys should sell for more money than Charizards. And if we're just doing some simple math, Bearing in mind what I just said about a approximately three to one ratio of Chansey to Charizard, one could argue it should sell for three times more than Charizard. But we know for a fact that Chansey does not sell for three times Charizard. Chansey is approximately a PSA 10 at about 20,000 US dollars, at least based at the time this video is being recorded. Charizards, on the other hand, are being literally shopped up in the market for about $220,000. So what gives? Why is it that Chansey has less of a population, but less of a price as well? Because again, according to the theories of supply and demand, Chansey should sell for more money than Charizard. Well, that brings us to our first idea, the theory of rarity by demand. This is a very simple idea, and it basically says, hey, People want the card, so people will outbid each other for the card. That will drive prices up. This theoretically, again, disagrees with and fundamentally ignores the idea of supply and demand, but that's what happens. Because Pokemon cards each uniquely feature a different species, and certain species of Pokemon are known to be more popular than others, different Pokemon cards may sell for different prices regardless of the population report. And so, in this particular case, we see a pretty good example of rarity. These cards are the same set, are the same edition, are the same print, are the same age. And yet for some reason, there can be three times more of a card and the card can sell for nearly 11 times more than a card that in population is significantly less and is equally as rare. However, the demand for Charizards hasn't ceased, and because of that, the price continues to rise. And this is a classic example of rarity by demand. Meaning, 
what should you take away from this? Well, cards that are in high demand will go for higher prices. And so it doesn't necessarily indicate just because a card is equally as rare as another card that it will ever sell for as much money. When making an investment, it's very critical and important to consider how in demand this card may be. A good way of testing that is to check which Pokemon species is on your actual trading card. If you're investing in something like a Greninja from a very modern set, one could argue it's a pretty good investment because Greninja is a fan favorite Pokemon and between the Pokemon video game as well as the Pokemon show, they have done quite a bit with Greninja and data has shown that it's actually quite a fan favorite Pokemon. As a result, in theory, because there's a lot of demand behind it, it may behave similarly to the way that Charizard behaves compared to Chansey within the same set. Now with that said, that brings us to our second type of rarity, and that is rarity by design. Rarity by design can easily be defined as the Pokemon card is exceptionally rare because of the design of the card. And I wanted to break this up into two logical buckets. So think of these as subsets underneath the design. The first is print. So let's firstly speak a little bit about print. In order to get there, let's go all the way back to 2001's Neo Discovery. Now a lot of people might say this is a weird spot to be at, and you're absolutely right, it totally is. Neo, Neo Discovery is not the most popular Neo set, but it does have some really interesting cards. And these cards can tell us quite a bit about this type of rarity, rarity by print design. So, which card are we particularly looking for? Well, it's a card you might have never even heard about. It's the number 17 for Neo Discovery. It is Yanma. And let's look at the first edition card to keep in track with looking at first edition Charizards. Now, reading across, you'll see that the card is exceptionally painfully rare. It has a total population of 311 with 142 9s and 12 PSA 10s. If we click on the shop button and let any eBay search results load, you'll actually see that there are no exact search results. However, there is a PSA 9 going for $1,049 with 14 days and 14 hours remaining. Now, what's up with this card? This card is a very, very unique card for one reason, and that is because when printed, this particular Pokemon card was a very small Pokemon species on the card itself and a lot of holographic. And so you'll see it reflected in the population report because it's incredibly hard to maintain the card in such a condition that by the time it arrives at PSA, it is still 10 worthy. That said, you could pull this card out of the pack and it could still be exceptionally damaged. Why is that? With a lot of holographic foil on the card and its age, it's incredibly difficult to think that the card has been kept in perfect condition in the pack and even when opened that doing a card trick or pulling cards off the surface of another card might not damage the holographic pattern. As a result, for all these different reasons, you might buy a pack, open it up, pull a Yanma first edition holo, put it in a sleeve, put it in a card saver, and mail it. At any given step along that process, such a large holographic pattern might cause the card to get damaged because of the way it's printed. It's not necessarily because it was produced poorly, but rather because there's just so much design on it that is holographic that it becomes exceptionally exceptionally hard in order to grade this card and get it as a PSA 10. As you can see 311 is a relatively small number but let's just look at the total population here in order to put things into perspective. So we see that there's about 9721 cards within the Neo Discovery bucket right? And that includes both editions because PSA didn't designate them separately in this particular set. And if you look across, you'll see something like Espeon is obviously a fan favorite Pokemon, has about 350. And Espeon and Umbreon, uh, both of which I believe are in this set, 
have a pretty solid amount of cards submitted for them. You have Tyranitar at 294, you have Umbreon at 396. So within this particular set, Yanma is a pretty high Pokemon in terms of population. And so the argument shouldn't be, oh, well, 311 is less than the previous page where it was over 2,000. This is a pretty submitted Pokemon card. And yet, for some reason, because of the way the card is printed and its overall design, it is exceptionally hard to grade. And therefore, a total population of PSA 10s overall being 12 means this card has historically, and by rumor, sold for up to $14,000. And this was prior to many of the COVID-19 related price increases we've seen over the past couple of months, meaning this card could potentially be a very, very exceptionally expensive card in the future. Now, what are some other cards that have a similar type of aesthetic to them? Well, there are a few that I think right off the bat, but EX Team Rocket Returns actually comes to mind. Now, if you've ever seen the Torchic Holographic Gold Star card, you'd actually be impressed at how crazy difficult it is to grade this card. Why is that? Well, as you can see on screen right now, this card is exceptionally difficult to grade because like Yanma, it has tons of holographic pattern. For whatever reason, this particular Gold Star card was printed with basically a holographic pattern and then they just chucked in a very small Torchic dead center on the card. As you can see in the population report, it's similar to the way that Yanma is. Not that many Pokemon cards come up in general up until we get to the PSA 9, where there's 124 of them by the way, but that number dramatically drops with only 16 PSA 10s. Again, when you're thinking about cards like this, you really want to focus in on the idea that by the design of the card and just the fact that it's printed the way it is, the card is exceptionally difficult to grade. There's tons of holographic, it will get scratched. As a result, prices will typically drop. Now, if you're looking for some cards to invest in this particular bucket, you're going to want to consider all of the different cards out there and look for the ones that are exceptionally difficult to grade. In theory, you want to buy enough of these and in good enough a condition that one of them will come back a 10 and will therefore help you to increase your overall collection. That said, most of the holographic cards from recent sets are not holographic, quote unquote, in the same way that these vintage cards are. So there might not be many options left in this particular era of cards that follow a similar trajectory. Instead, your time and money and energy might be better spent looking down, hunting down, and finding either Team Rocket Returns packs to open up, or purchasing raw editions of Torchix and Yanmas, etc., etc., submitting them, and realizing and recognizing that although it might be very, very difficult to accomplish, getting a PSA 10 will be very much worth your time and energy as both of these cards have historically sold for prices well above $10,000 even before considering the growth the Pokemon hobby is seeing over the past couple of months. So going along with the rarity by design element, we do have a second subsection as I had mentioned and that is design production. What does that mean? Well, in order to go there, we're going to have to go instead of Neo Discovery and Yanma back in time a year to Neo Genesis. And within Neo Genesis, I think we're pretty much all kind of having a good idea where this is going to go. That's right. It's going to be Typhlosion. So uh, just to kind of prove my point here, Typhlosion is a starter Pokemon, so obviously very high in demand. It's also the fire type Pokemon. And it's also a Neo series, meaning that Neo Genesis particularly has seen a huge jump in increase over 2020. 581 total cards is pretty much on par with many of the different holo cards. The only one that is potentially greater is the Lugia holographic card, and that's because Lugia is a fan favorite and a um, legendary Pokemon as well. And as you can see, um, Typhlosion is also pretty high in demand all things considered given that other starter Pokemon like Meganium 
are only in the 400s and the fur alligators are also in the 400s. So in the grand scheme of things, a pretty highly submitted card for the set. Bear in mind that unlike the Neo Discovery page, ne this Neo Genesis page is actually first edition only. So these total numbers are purely out of the first edition set. 14,000 cards and approximately 1,200 of them are the Typhlosion species and of them 581 are the T17 card. Now, rarity by design production. What does that mean? Production refers to the way the card is made, meaning how good was the quality assurance, how good was the overall print quality, how good was this card printed. It's not necessarily that the card is designed to be difficult to grade unlike the previous examples we saw. Instead, the card might be just poorly combined or poorly printed, might have print lines, might have inherent flaws directly out of the pack that impact its rarity. Typhlosion is one of these cards. As you can see, not much in terms of the lower grades, but by the time you get to PSA 9, there's 141. And then there's literally less of these cards than most people have fingers on their hands. You can literally count the entire population with two hands. Now, what does that mean? This card, very, very high in demand. PSA 9s go for over $4,000 based on eBay most recent sales. And for the most part, PSA 10s are far and few to come by to begin with. And then in addition to that, when they do sell, they are typically private sales that disappear into a collection forever. The last rumored sale that I had heard of was $18,000, and that was before the pandemic set in in 2020. Again, a rumor, but even if it is, the idea that this card may sell for $20,000 does not really surprise me. Neo Genesis had been slept on for so long, and this card particularly exceptionally hard to grade right out of the pack, and so its rarity by design certainly could drive that price. So, let's talk a little bit about this card and why it is difficult by its production. So, when this card was produced, and the Neo series is overall very notorious for this, there were a few inherent flaws. First things first is that many people argue that the overall print quality on these cards had dropped significantly. And so, it was exceptionally difficult to get cards out of the packs that weren't either horrendously off-centered or that weren't cut with a dull or otherwise poor quality blade. Meaning, you could have whitening on the edges, you could have chipping on the edges, and you could have bird edges literally out of the pack. In addition to this, centering was always going to be a very bad issue, and in addition to this, many of the cardstock and many of the printer inkjets also had an error and so the Typhlosion T17 and many other Neo cards have what is known as a red dot error. So all of these reasons combined to make this card basically impossible to grade directly out of the pack. Now you might think I'm done telling you about all of the different things that are wrong with this card and the way it was produced, but you'd be mistaken. In addition to that, this card has a hilariously large holographic surface, similar to the cards previous, but what makes this card such a good example of production errors is that by the time this card was printed, it was also being printed very sloppily. And so it's not uncommon for many of these cards to come out of the pack with holographic print lines or scratches that run the entire length of the card in a straight line. Again, given all of the known issues with production and quality assurance with Pokemon cards around this particular era, it's almost guaranteed that these print lines on the holographic pattern are coming directly from the factory and weren't caused by the card being shifted around or opened poorly. Many, many packs have been opened, many of these Typhlosions have been pulled, and there's a reason why many of them don't get a PSA 10. It's not because each and every single person did the exact same thing and caused the exact same print lines. Rather, we know for a fact that from the factory, these cards were effectively just busted 
and then when you open them up very few of them ever were PSA 10 quality. In addition to all of this you now have to add on the added difficulty that we went over a little bit earlier. When you're opening up the pack are you taking care to protect the hollow foil? When you drag the card if you do the card trick are you shifting the hollow and causing any additional damage to the card? And are you using a good card saver and sleeve that doesn't have any micro particles in it that could further abraze either the back or the holographic surface? All of these factors considered, PSA 9s are abundant, PSA 8s are even more abundant. And for that slim population of PSA 10s, easily over $15,000 all because of the way these cards were produced at the factory. Now, some other cards that bear a similar type of aesthetic include the Plasma Storm Secret Rares from the Black and White era. So this Charizard card right here, as you can see, is a fairly well submitted card, 855, which is pretty impressive given the overall population of cards. And just to satisfy my own curiosity, yeah, there's only 2,807 cards submitted to PSA for Plasma Storm, um, and 800 of them, or approximately almost 25%, probably closer to 30, are this Charizard card. So a very highly submitted card. Take a look at this. Of the 855, more than... 600 of them, if I'm doing my math correctly, probably 700 of them are either 8s or 9s, and less than 10% of the total population are PSA 10s. Why is this? The card is notorious for coming out of the factory with centering issues. So similar to the way that the Neo cards were oftentimes printed off-centered, so too is the case with this particular secret rare Charizard. Many of them have horrendous centering issues, and so typically the challenge with this particular card isn't going to be around the surface or the holographic, but rather mainly the centering right out of the pack will disqualify you. As you can see, similar to the Typhlosion, it's nothing that you necessarily did to the card in order to damage it. Rather, it's just the fact that it came from the factory busted, and the chances of you getting one that was PSA 10 worthy was borderline impossible. Even if you did, it then had to survive the journey, and then, on top of everything else, depending on the particular grader, you might just get dinged for getting ding sake. So in the grand scheme of things, another card. For investment opportunities, I would definitely recommend doing the same thing. For any of these cards that are print by design, whether it be their, their rarity by design print or rarity by design production, either of them, you need to just buy a whole bunch of them, submit in bulk, keep your standards very high, and hopefully by keeping your standards high and elevating it, you can hopefully score a 10. After that, in theory, that one card should be worth so much that it could potentially pay for all of your other activities. And then don't forget, you're also going to have a bunch of cards that get graded as 8s and 9s, and because many of these cards are so rare, you should theoretically also be able to make a profit, assuming you can get a 10 and a few 8s and 9s. Again, you're going to want to look for cards that come out off-centered and or really busted from the factory, and just hope that you can get some really good versions of the card to submit. And then, hopefully, when you grade them, you should get a nice surprise in your population report. So finally but not least, we come to Rarity by Play. And Rarity by Play is a surprisingly simple and somewhat obvious metric, but a lot of people don't consider it up until it's kind of in motion. So never forget, the Pokemon trading card game is in fact, and prepare yourself for this, it might be a shock, a trading card game. And there are many hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people who play the actual trading card game. As a result, in the past, many, many cards were played competitively because of their usability in the metagame. And because of that, many of the different aspects of the card have dwindled in quality over the years. Now, if we want a card that was exceptionally playable and is now exceptionally rare in part due to the fact that it was playable, let's look at Rayquaza Gold Star out of EX Deoxys. The 107th and final card in the set 
has a total population of 386. Overall, Rayquaza is about 10% of the total population of 3,523 EX Deoxys cards that have ever been submitted. Now, what does that mean? It's obviously a very highly submitted card. The problem? Of the 386, about 12 to 13% of them are PSA 10s. Everything else is either a 9 or less. Why is that? Well, Rayquaza Gold Star was a card that was exceptionally playable in the trading card game. And as a result, when the trading cards were being printed and produced, many people who got this card immediately placed it into their deck and built a deck around it. As a result, many of these cards are now in played to heavily played condition. And as a result, even if it does sit in a binder undisturbed for 10 years, assuming it was used in a deck, it's probably been handled enough that it's either no longer gradable or it's gradable, but you're not going to get as impressive a grade. And to that theory, I want to point out that unlike many of the cards that we've looked at today, you should note that there's actually quite a solid disbursement of numbers across the 2 to 8 spectrum. Typically with cards that we've been looking at, you've seen that, for example, you'll take a look and there'll be virtually nothing in the middle and then everything kind of gets clustered around the nine, 8, 9, and 10 brackets. The same is true of many of the cards we've looked at. But if you look at Rayquaza, what you'll notice is that for those that have been submitted, a fair majority of them fall into the middle tier. And then obviously PSA 9s are always going to be a large number and 10s are going to be a small number. And so what's interesting about this card is that its population is indicative that many heavily played or lightly played versions of the card are being submitted and graded. Now, one thing that I would be bad not to call out is the exceptional rarity of EX era cards. In addition to the fact that this card was so exceptionally playable, EX cards in general were in short supply, and so there aren't that many EX Deoxys boxes and packs floating around the collectible market anymore. In fact, you're lucky if you find one box per sale every year, and even if it does sell, good luck purchasing it after all of the different price increases we've seen over the 2020 calendar year. What does all this mean? Rayquaza was exceptionally playable, it's incredibly rare, and in order to pull one of these, you're likely going to have to open what is approximately a four to $500 pack in order to pull it. And that is assuming you can get your hands on a pack of these cards. In the grand scheme of things, it means not only is there a really bad overall condition to the cards that are out there, for the cards that still remain unopened in booster packs, it's going to be so incredibly costly to open those booster packs. And then, on top of that, bear in mind that the approximate pull rate for any Gold Star card is about 1 in 72 booster packs, and there are three different Gold Star cards that you can pull out of a EX Deoxys booster pack meaning your approximate odds in order to pull is going to be nearly triple that of any other random gold star card that you wanted to pull. In the grand scheme of things, what does this mean? It's basically impossible to pull one and grade it as a PSA 10, and that means that for many of the people who have this card, it's become either a corner piece of their collection or the main piece, assuming that a Charizard first edition card isn't sitting directly to the left or right of it. So, some investment opportunities like this one, you're going to want to identify cards that are incredibly playable, because as the general population uses the card in decks, you're going to want to have these cards graded right away when they're fresh out of their pack, and then go ahead and put them up. Some cards that stick out in my mind right away are the ADP cards. The Arceus, Palkia, and Dialga card is notorious in the metagame right now, and as a result, I think its alternate art form in specific is a really cool, good-looking card that a lot of people are going to remember either fondly for using it in their own deck or hated for going up against it and not being able to quite conquer it. There are many other cards in the meta that you can probably research that follow this path, but 
One thing to bear in mind is that they don't have the same pull rates as gold stars. I always caution people when approaching anything and comparing it with a gold star card because gold stars were so exceptionally rare that they may very well be and they actually have been referred to as the best chase cards in the Pokemon game, period. And so I caution anyone to approach a gold star card and assume that a modern card is going to follow the same trajectory. It may mimic the trajectory, but only as a proportion of the total growth. What does that mean? Don't expect ADP graded a PSA 10 to sell for $30,000 the same way Rayquaza Gold Star does. Rayquaza Gold Star is in a league all its own, and ADP might see a similar percentage of appreciation, but the total number is going to be very, very small compared to that of a Gold Star card. So, with that said, friends, the one other thing I wanted to leave you all with today is the idea that you need to also take into consideration that these three types of rarity, demand, design, and play, they could theoretically overlap on each other as well, um, right? So first edition Charizard cards, I immediately put into the demand bucket because obviously there's a lot of demand for them. But don't forget that it was also Pokemon's very awkward first attempt at ever printing Pokemon cards. So in theory, the design of the cards isn't necessarily always the best. You know, you might get a box that was horrendously off-centered. In addition to that, don't forget that this card, although it might not have been played a lot in the metagame for the TCG, a lot of kids were probably running around with this card in their hand or in their pocket or in a sleeve and therefore damaged the card. So theoretically, all three of these apply. The most important thing is to use these three types of rarities as general thematics lenses and what you can do is you can identify a card you can see if it meets the criteria that we've stepped through for each and any single one of the different types of rarity and then you can use that to determine whether or not the card will be worth grading and investing in into the future more importantly if you come up against a seller who is really kind of pushing the idea that it's a low population card and therefore is worth a lot of money, you can use these lenses to see whether or not the card was demanded, whether or not it's hard to grade, and whether or not it was a playable card and therefore the overall population of gem mint condition cards might be lower. By doing this, you'll be able to make more informed investment choices and therefore hopefully not only help to build your collection, but also create a little bit of inherent buffer and a little bit of inherent value in your own Pokemon cards as you go about collecting. As always, I definitely recommend taking into consideration these, but also collecting what you love, because um, it's definitely more fun when you collect cards that you like, and then if it just so happens that it fits this lens, that's pretty cool. But in the grand scheme of things, you'll also have to make decisions that will help you to accomplish your own collecting goals, as well as your goals in the overall hobby. So with that said, friends, thanks again for checking out today's video. I do hope you learned something new, and if you did, I encourage you to leave a like on this video and let me know down below what you learned. I also would definitely appreciate you to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you're new here and you learned something new today. I make tons of content like this all the time, and your subscription helps me to know that I am doing the right thing, creating valuable content, and for me to help my own channel grow and for me to help develop myself as a content creator with that said as always i appreciate your viewership either way hope you guys are having an amazing day um don't go buy anything for fourteen thousand dollars please i don't want to hear a horror story about how i told you there's 20 in the world and now you bought it D don't do that just let it go on auction we'll see what it sells for and then you can make an informed decision right after that but as always appreciate you guys and we'll talk soon Peace.